today's study tip, I am your best resource to do well in this class, okay? So please make sure you're asking me questions. Attend office hours, which are on Zoom every Monday, 12 to 1. Um, if you want additional time, you can email me and we can arrange something. Maybe even do another Zoom for the whole class if, um, if I have enough interest, right? I really want to help you guys. I want you to feel confident. Send me emails. Um, a lot of you have send, sent me emails and um, some of you I, I've never even really interacted with, okay? Students who interact with me tend to be the A and B students and students that never interact with me tend to be the, the C or lower and it's um, it's because of this process of active learning, right? So if you're act actively engaged, asking questions, you do better. If you have positive interaction with me, you also tend to do better because you feel more encouraged, right? So again, please utilize me for help. Let's finish strong. Um, you'll see that the last part is faded because, you know, now that we're quarantined, you can't do this, but normally I would encourage you to hang out with me after class, uh, hear other people's questions, and you know, everyone gets to kind of form an impromptu little study group, and it's, it's really beneficial. So uh, keep that in mind for future classes. Okay, so today is urinary system part one. It is long and it is tough. Be prepared to take lots of notes, pause, rewind a lot, okay? Don't try to rush through this chapter. Spend lots and lots of time, okay? Uh, overall, functions of the kidneys, you already know, uh, form urine, but you do that because you're filtering the blood, right? So you filter the blood and then your waste will be urine, okay? Why do we filter the blood? We need to regulate the volume of blood, right? We need to regulate the blood volume for lots of reasons. One, for blood pressure, right? Um, we need to make sure that we can, well, we wanna keep our vascular system healthy and our heart healthy, right? But we also want to make sure we maintain um, the correct pressure so that fluid exchange can happen, uh, which we talked about um, from the last unit, right? Okay, we need to balance our ions. We need to maintain pH. Remember that blood pH, 7.35 to 7.45. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about pH in, um, in the coming uh, weeks. Okay, so what kind of waste do we eliminate? Most uh, predominantly nitrogenous waste. Remember that we do not um, store up extra protein. Whatever protein you don't use gets broken down. So amino acids uh, are waste and then that's going to lead to urea, right? So that's your nitrogenous waste. Then of course you'll have other um, toxins and waste from things that you've consumed. Um, and byproducts of metabolism, and then uh, yeah, any drugs that you consumed, um, their byproducts, right? And then when balancing pH and ions, you'll also have a lot of hydrogen to get rid of. And remember, um, we see a lot of hydrogen um, when we look at metabolism. So this, this should not be a surprise. Okay, next acid-base balance, right? Again, to maintain the correct pH of the blood and um, the exchange, uh, your acid-base balance, your kidneys play an important role and then your respiratory system plays the other half. So together, your respiratory system and your kidneys are um, what maintain acid-base balance and this is so that you can breathe, essentially so that you can breathe correctly and get oxygen 
throughout your body, but also get rid of CO2, which is waste product from metabolism, right? And so we'll have a whole lecture devoted to acid-base balance and lab. So we won't be talking about that today. All right, so recall your anatomy. You have your renal cortex and you have your renal medulla. Your nephron is going to go from the cortex into the medulla, right? So um, it's not shown here, I'm gonna show it on the next slide, but the nephron is the major unit that we'll be focused on. And this is where urine is made. So when the fluid is inside the nephron, we call it the filtrate. And then when it empties into the minor and major calyx, then it's called urine, right? And then it'll go to your ureter and then to your bladder. Okay, let's see, what else did I wanna point out? Make sure you know all the parts. You should already know them from um, anatomy. So just review. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. So your nephron, recall you, you start with your, um, your Bowman's capsule or glomerulus, and then you go into your proximal, dis, uh, proximal convoluted tubule. Then you go into your loop of Henle, right? And of course that's descending and then ascending, and then your distal proximal, I'm sorry, distal convoluted tubule and then your collecting duct, okay? So you're in the renal cortex and then you're in the renal medulla and then you're back in the renal cortex, okay? What else, what else did we wanna talk about? So blood enters the glomerulus, right? And that's going to be afferent. And then this is where uh, filtrate is made. We'll talk about this more in a second. And then blood exits, and we'll call that efferent. Okay. Um, so you have blood flow in, and then some stuff will get filtered out and become filtrate, and that'll go into your tubule. Okay. Also notice that you you have your blood capillary continue to be. Uh, kind of wrapped around and in close association with these tubules. So we'll see more interactions happening there as well. So that's important. Um, and so in this image and in, in most images of the nephron, the blood vessels are not shown completely because it gets really, it's really intricate. It gets really messy and it's hard to see what's going on. So just remember that that's there. And I'll have another picture of that for you. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so this whole section, the renal cortex and the renal medulla, which contains your entire nephron, okay? And again, your nephron starts with the glomerulus and goes all the way through to the collecting duct, okay? Um, so that's your renal pyramid. And that's the functional unit of the kidney. That is where filtrate is produced and then eventually when all the exchange is finished then you'll have urine down the collecting duct. Um, you release your urine. Okay? Okay, so as I said the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. This is the nephron tone without any of the vascular system. Okay? Bowman's capsule right here. Also more, maybe more specifically, the glomerulus. You have blood supply in, then you'll have filtration occur, and then blood go back out, okay? Anything that's been filtered out of the blood is now called filtrate, and it's gonna travel through all the tubules. The first set uh, is all twisty, and it's closest to the capsule, so it's called proximal, proximal convoluted tubule. Then you have your loop of Henle, okay? And when it's going down, it's descending. When it's going up, it's ascending. And please don't be confused if we reverse this, if we show the Bowman's capsule over here and the collecting 
um, ducked over here because that is what you'll see. I think the first half we, we look at it this way and then the second half we look at it the other way. Okay, and then your Lupa Henle will empty into your distal convoluted tubule and then that will empty into the collecting duct. Okay, so Mactrician reflex is the uh, the urge to urinate is how you are able to empty your bladder. The bladder is able to um, fill and so it actually will stretch as it fills up with fluid and you have receptors which are stretch receptors so they will notice that your bladder is filling up in anywhere from 250 to 400 milliliters will be enough to um, alert your brain that it's time to empty your bladder, okay? So the parasympathetic nervous system reflex um, to contract the bladder, okay? Uh, urinary sphincters, you have smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. So internal smooth muscle is going to be involuntary and then your external skeletal muscle is going to be voluntary. And this is where, uh, you know, kid, little kids uh, that haven't developed their myelination around the neurons that innervate the skeletal muscle, um, that's, they're not going to be able to control, right? So they're going to be in diapers. And then you potty train once they start to develop myelination and they can learn to control their bladder, right? So external skeletal muscle does take time to um, have control over that. And then unfortunately, as you age, you will lose that. Um, the opposite of emptying your bladder, so mactrician reflex is to urinate or empty the bladder. The opposite is the guarding reflex. This allows the bladder to continue to fill by inhibiting Mactrician center of the pons. Okay, watch this link. In fact, pause me and watch this link right now because it shows you the mactrician reflex and it shows you the guarding reflex. Okay, so hopefully you watched the link. Recall guarding reflex allows you to fill up your bladder and mactrician reflex allows you to empty your bladder and you have control over your external skeletal muscle sphincter okay okay so clinical stories kidney stones can occur uh, 80 percent of kidney stones are made up of calcium oxalate they will get stuck in the ureters and are very painful. Okay, that's going to also interfere with your ability to urinate. Um, so this is then going to interfere with the whole function of, of the kidney, right? Your fluid balance, how much fluid is in your blood. If you can't get rid of fluid quickly enough, then you're probably going to have higher blood pressure, right? In addition to pain urinating um, also can put you at risk for infection. Okay, so uh, kidney stones are bad news. You want to avoid them. What's the best way to prevent kidney stones? Stay hydrated. Drink lots of water. Don't drink soda and you cannot consider coffee um, as part of your fluid intake. In fact, you should take in more water if you've had a diuretic like coffee, okay? And um, don't even count milk, right? So just water. If, you, if you're if you one of those people who doesn't like water, then you need to get creative. You need to add, um, you know, there's fruit, right? You could do lemon or lime or both, cucumber, anything you can think of to uh, flavor your water naturally. But there's also little drops and packets that pe people sell that can give it some flavor. Um, if you do those packets, watch out for sugar, watch out for artificial sweeteners. But anyways, you get the point. Okay, so once you have a kidney stone, you're going to be more prone to get them. 
so prevent them prevention is key once you have a, a kidney stone you are going to have to be very careful to drink um, plenty of water because you're going to be more prone to them and again that also puts you at risk for an infection our kidneys are vital organs you need to take care of them um, worst thing well there's a few bad things you could do but one of the worst things that uh, is common that people don't think about are energy drinks they are terrible on your kidneys okay don't don't drink energy drinks okay so if you get a kidney stone what do you do well you go to the doctor you're in a lot of pain they will treat it with sonic waves to break it into smaller pieces if they're able to it depends on the position and the size and whatnot um, but if they catch it typically if they catch it early enough um, they can break it up with sonic waves you can also only have that done so many times in your life and within a year so if you're having recurrent kidney stones uh, you might not be a candidate for sonic wave treatment um, at some point surgery would be a last resort if it's uh, absolutely necessary um, surgery is kind of rare okay so like I said prevent with drinking lots of water incontinence as you age you lose that control over the voluntary um, skeletal muscle sphincter you're unable to um, exert control over matrician right you lose essentially you're losing your guarding reflex um, so your bladder is unable to hold um, urine and you're going to urinate so this is why they sell depends right but what else can you do right so yes this is natural as you age the strength of the, your sphincters uh, deter decrease right um, just like everything unfortunately in your body right all of your muscles are gonna get weaker so exercise of course is one of the predominant things that you can do to keep your muscles strong um, if you're overweight losing weight is very important because it's going to put more pressure on your bladder and um, then you might need to also keep track of your food intake and make sure that you are you know going to the restroom um, this could mean setting a timer going every hour every hour and a half just just in case um, or you could track okay I just drink a glass of water so I know that in one hour I should go to the restroom and then one more hour after that okay um, so timed bathroom breaks another thing is medication sometimes medication is given um, to help but of course you still need to have good practices okay so don't be rude or judgmental when you are uh, working with people or even just in your social life um, you know older individuals who um, struggle with incontinence because it will happen to you one day okay three processes of urine formation this is a simplified di diagram it's not showing the um, it's not showing your convoluted tubules it's not showing the loop of Henley right it's just showing it as a short straight tube for simplicity so in the bottom corner I um, just put a little reminder of what the nephron actually looks like right but for simplicity we're gonna look here okay so starting with your glomerulus you have your blood flow in and you have a mixture of large and small substances so proteins are gonna to be too large. Sorry if you heard my dryer. <laughs> okay, proteins such as these larger green spheres, they are too big to go through. So they're going to remain in the blood, um, but smaller particles like glucose and salt, they are going to be able to um, filter through and become part of the filtrate. Okay, and we're gonna look at this more closely in a minute. So now you have your smaller particles, like um, very small peptides, glucose, salt, they become part of the filtrate, okay? And then you 
as you go through your tubules, you will reabsorb certain molecules like glu glucose. You're always going to reabsorb all of your glucose, right? If you have extra glucose, you're going to make glycogen. If your glycogen reserves are full, then you're going to uh, make your glycerol for your, uh, your triglycerides for fat adipose tissue, right? Okay. So uh, second step, reabsorption, right? Certain molecules will be reabsorbed back into the blood. And then third, and this is tricky, this is the part that usually is the hardest, we call it secretion, but this is uh, your blood capillaries that are not shown in this picture, but are con um, wrapped around um, or in close association with your tubules. You can have certain molecules that will go straight from your blood capillaries into the filtrate, right? So just like you see here, you see these capillaries and you have certain molecules coming into the filtrate. Well, when you have your blood exit the glomerulus here, as it exits, it's going to those capillaries going to make these small capillaries that branch um, and wrap around okay so secretion extra molecules from the capillary going straight into the filtrate okay and then eventually that all whatever's left in the filtrate will be excreted as urine okay um, Okay, so urine formation filtration is the first step. It's the movement of substances from your glomerulus to the glomerular capsule. Only small substances uh, will be able to do this. You make about 180 liters of filtrate every day. You keep the vast majority of that, right? You don't urinate very much, right? You don't urinate in liters. Okay, um, 125 milliliters per minute. So seeing 180 liters per day is not helpful when we want to um, examine someone's urine function. We're not going to monitor them typically, right, for an entire day and add up all the liters. Now there are times where that will be done. But for the most part, we want a we want to know mils per minute. This is a more um, an easier um, unit to work with. So if you were to divide this out, right, 180 liters divided by 24 hours in a day, and then 60 minutes in an hour, then you'll get 125 mils per minute. And we call this the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate. 20% of your blood plasma moves into your glomerular capsule, okay? So for each, you know, you're, you're filtering about 20% of your blood plasma um, every day, is what this is saying. Um, here we go, continued. I knew I wanted to talk more. Reabsorption. So we just said that you're going to filter out 180 liters. You're going to make 180 liters of filtrate every day, but you're going to reabsorb most of that. So reabsorption. Movement of substances from the renal tubing, so your nephron, back into the blood. So you can think of this as uh, everything that you want to save. Okay, you want to save water, you want to save glucose, you're going to reabsorb certain molecules along with that water, okay? Um, 178.5 liters of the 180 are going to be reabsorbed every day. So how much urine does that mean that you actually produce? How much do you get rid of? You make 180, you keep 178.5, so that's going to leave you with 1.5 liters. So in an entire day, you should urinate one and a half liters. 
Of course, if you're dehydrated, you won't urinate that much. Um, next, secretion, right? Talked about this is where molecules go directly from, and here's the picture. You have, uh, so here it's reversed from what we've been looking at. You have your uh, Bowman's capsule or your glomerulus here, and you have everywhere, look, you have your tubule, your nephron, and you see this uh, weaving of your uh, blood capillaries, okay? And so substances from your, your blood can also go directly into the tubule. So if it didn't happen here in the glomerulus, it could still happen as secretion. When it happens in the glomerulus, it's called filtration. When it happens elsewhere, from the blood to the tubule, it's called secretion. So selective removal of substances from the blood to the renal tubules. And then lastly, right, once you go through the entire nephron, down your collecting duct, then you eliminate your urine. So filtration, renal filtration. So you have your glomerulus right here, right? And here is your Bowman's capsule, your glomerular capsule that surrounds the glomerulus. And why? Because you need something to contain your filtrate. So substances from your blood, right? So you have afferent arterial blood coming in, and then you have substances, water, glucose, salt, small peptides, all of those are going to uh, filter through the glomerulus and then they'll be collected within the uh, glomerul glomerular capsule and then travel into the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, and that and then that's called filtrate. Okay, so you need to have these substances in order to become filtrate have to be able to get through the three layers of the glomerulus. So if you look at a region of the glomerulus, the first thing you'll notice are these podocytes, um, are what we call like foot processes, right? Here, these funny looking cells, okay? And um, that's the visceral layer of the uh, glomerulus, okay? And if you look at that, you can more closely, like we see here, you'll see that there's little slits. So you have a foot process, right, which is shown here, and here, and here, and in between the feet are slits where filtration can happen. If you look beyond that, further inward, I guess you could say, you'll have your uh, basement membrane and then past that you'll have your endothelium. So this is the capillary right here, the capillary endothelium. Um, and of course you can also look, look at this picture here. And so notice all the dots in the inside of uh, the glomerulus, the endothelium. Uh, it All those dots are little pores which call a uh, fenstrae or uh, fenstrations. Some people uh, call it so tiny pores in the capillary endothelium. Okay, then you have your basement membrane shown in pink, and then you have your visceral layer of Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, which is made up of these uh, podocytes, the orange part, um, and the spaces in between are your filtration slits. Okay. So one more time, filtration membrane consists of three parts. Your fenestrate of the capillary, those were the little uh, dots or specks all over the uh, endothelium. Then you have your basement membrane, and then you have your visceral layer, which has the podocytes, which in between each podocyte is a filtration slit. Okay, what gets filtered? I already mentioned water, salt, glucose and small peptides. You will not be able to fit cells, they're way too big. You will not be able to fit 
actual proteins, you know, or polypeptides. They're too big. All of the fluid now, the water, salt, glucose, small peptides, everything that's just been filtered out is now called the filtrate and it enters the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so just like we did with fluid uh, movement in interstitial fluid, we're going to look at that now in the kidney, okay? So we have our force, we'll have the effect, and we'll have the pressure, and then we'll calculate the total is filtration happening and at what rate, okay? So in uh, the blood coming into the glomerulus is called the glomerular blood pressure. And of course, this is what's favoring or pushing filtration to happen. And so it happens at 55 millimeters of mercury and wants to push it out of the glomerulus in to become filtrate. So when you see out, that means out of the capillary to become filtrate. And then you have your glomerular colloid osmotic pressure, just like we saw colloid osmotic pressure in, um, in the capillary. Okay, this is for the same reason. You have proteins in the blood. They're big, they're trapped. Water is attracted to them, to these proteins. So this is opposing filtration, right? And um, so the proteins in your blood attract water. And so water doesn't want to leave the capillary and become part of the filtrate. So you have an opposing um, pressure and it's 30 millimeters of mercury that are pushing in, okay? So you have more pressure pushing out than you do pushing in. But we also have capsular hydrostatic pressure, which also opposes filtration. This uh, capsular hydrostatic pressure is simply, it sounds really complex, but it, it's simply the filtrate that you already produced. So you already have this fluid outside of the glomerulus pushing against it. And so that opposes filtration. And that's uh, 15 millimeters of mercury millimeters of mercury. Um, so now we need to add this all together and we're not going to use an equation like we did last time. We're simply just going to add it all up. So I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. Um, so net filtration, we want to look at, uh, is it favoring filtration or not? And in this case it is. So Take 55 out, subtract 30 in, subtract 15 in, and that gives you a total of 10, and that was out, okay? So you, I always start with the biggest number and subtract it all the other opposites. So regulation of the GFR, we have extrinsic control. This is your sympathetic nervous system can uh, constrict your blood flow to the kidney, right? So the afferent arterial is the blood supply to the glomerulus. So you can constrict that. That's going to give you less blood into the glomerulus. So the re result is your GFR will decrease. Intrinsic control. If your blood pressure drops you don't want to lower your gfr you want to maintain it right we need to take care of our blood right blood is really really important we call we said in one of our chapters blood is king right so the kidneys are going to do everything they can to maintain your blood and to do that you need to maintain your normal gfr so if your blood pressure suddenly drops your afferent arterioles are going to do what in order to keep your glomerular blood pressure normal? You're going to need to get more blood 
into the glomerulus, so you're going to vasodilate. If your blood pressure gets high, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to vasoconstrict so that, again, you keep your glomerular blood pressure constant in the normal range, okay? So what was normal GFR? 180 liters per day. What is that per minute? 125 milliliters per minute. Okay, so here's a problem for you, actually two problems for you to work on. Explain what would happen to GFR and urine volume in these two different people. So first person is a patient with liver disease. So I want you to think about if someone has liver disease, how might that affect their production of albumin and how would that affect their GFR? And then how would their GFR affect their urine output? Two, a patient with kidney stones. How are kidney stones going to affect the renal tubules? How will that affect filtration rate? How will that affect the urine volume? Okay, so pause the video and work through these. Okay, so hopefully you pause the video and you're ready to go over these. Okay, so I actually have a couple of slides here that I'm going to show you. Okay, so for the first example question we had, it was a person with liver disease. And I just copied your previous slide so that we can look at this as a reference. So normally you have 55 out, 30 in, 15 in. But this person has liver disease, okay? And if they have liver disease, then they probably are making less protein. So if they're making less protein like albumin, especially albumin, that was what I told you to focus on. Okay, so less protein, now they're going to have um, less osmotic pressure. And so let's say 25, for example. So this is still opposing filtration, but it's a little bit less, you have a little less protein, so you have a little less colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, so then that's it, you solve it. So 55 out, 25 in, 15 in. So instead of having a total of 10 out, you're going to have 15. So did this increase filtration or decrease? Yeah, it still favors filtration. So now your GFR has increased. Okay, so that was example one. The person with liver disease is not going to be able to make as much albumin, therefore their colloid osmotic pressure will decrease and um, we're just making up a number here, 25. Uh, if I gave you a test question, I'd either have to give you a specific number or all you would be able to tell me is in general, this number would decrease and that would overall increase the GFR rate, right? And then of course, what does that do to urine? If you have a higher GFR, you're going to have more urine. So that is one of the symptoms of liver disease is frequent or increased urination. Okay, next example the patient with kidney stones, okay? So if you have kidney stones, it's going to block, right? They're gonna collect, the stones are going to collect at the end of your tubules um, or even in your ureters, okay? Uh, if they're small enough to get through or as there's enough pressure, eventually they get through, they can get into your ureter. Um, 
but for the most part they tend to collect um, here. Either way, what is it going to do? It's going to decrease your ability to excrete urine, right? So decrease. Now, what is that going to do? It's not going to change your blood flow in, right? That's still the same. So I'll put a check mark, same. You're not changing your proteins in your blood, so that stays the same. But you're not getting rid of the, your filtrate as easily, so this pressure is going to increase. So instead of 15, let's say it's 20. So 55, right, minus 30 minus 20. And so now your GFR and goodness guys, I'm sorry how sloppy this is. Your GFR is now going to go down because your capsular hydrostatic pressure increased and it opposes filtration. So instead of having 10 pushing out, you're only going to have five, five pushing out. Okay, so you have um, a reduction in GFR, you're going to have a reduction in urine. Okay, and why is this so important again? Because now you've, you're losing some of your ability to regulate your blood, right? Your blood volume, which affects blood pressure, but also all of the things that you need to filter and be able to get rid of. And then lastly, um, it increases your risk of infection. Okay, so all the functions of your kidney are vital and um, these examples, both of these examples uh, interfere with your kidney function. Okay, next, sodium reabsorption. Oh, I need to change my mouse back to an arrow. Okay, so sodium reabsorption can occur in several locations of the nephron. We're first going to look at proximal convoluted tubule, and then we'll look at the others. Okay, so sodium reabsorption in your proximal convoluted tubule, it's, uh, sodium is going to flow from high concentration to low concentration, through the sodium glucose co-transporter, and that's gonna go across the um, apical membrane, which you'll see in the next slide. Then it has a base, basolateral membrane to cross, and this, this is now going from low to high concentration, so it's going to require energy. And in fact, our kidneys take a lot of energy and 80% of all of the energy consumed in the kidney is for this process to pump, actively pump sodium through or across the basolateral membrane. And of course, potassium will go in the opposite direction. We'll see that in a second. 65% of your sodium reabsorption is happening here in your proximal convoluted tubule. This is not a valid abbreviation. Do not do this. I only did this to fit on the slide, okay? But it, you should write it all the way out, proximal convoluted tubule, okay? Now, after you move out of your proximal convoluted tubule, you'll enter the loop of Henle. We will reabsorb about 25% of sodium, and then, you, your filtrate moves to your distal convoluted tubule, and we control this. Uh, we adjust it as needed. So if you need more salt or you need more water, um, this amount will vary. Okay, so about 10% reabsorption of sodium in the distal convoluted tubule. Um, but as I said, it's adjusted as needed. So it depends on how much salt you've consumed, how much water you've consumed. Um, also want to mention here in the sodium glucose uh, co-transporter, um, the glucose 
will just diffuse all the way, um, the rest of the way into the capillary. Uh, it's the only the sodium that has to be actively pumped for the rest of the process. Okay, so let's look at this picture. Okay, this picture, uh, we've added text here in blue. So you're not gonna find that in your book. Um, so I titled this reabsorption. So this is a uh, reabsorption of sodium. Okay, this yellow cell here is your proximal tubule, convoluted tubule cell, okay? So a cell from your proximal convoluted tubule. The lumen is this region here. So your filtrate is flowing through. And then your sodium and your glucose from your filtrate are going to be co-transported down into the cell. Once that happens, glucose, like I said, will just facilitate a diffusion because it does need a, a protein channel right but no energy needed it's just gonna passively diffuse through into the capillary however your sodium you have more sodium in your blood so you're now having to go from low sodium in your tubule cell to higher sodium in your blood capillary so this is going to be active transport but we have to do this it's very important so your kidney will invest all this ATP to pump this. And as you pump a sodium into your blood, you will take a potassium out of your blood. What else? Um, I think that's it, okay? So study this. There's a lot going on in this picture. Know each part of this picture and then uh, review the this, this key highlights that I mentioned here, okay? And then also look over it in your book and read the description in your book. Okay, so reabsorption continued. So we don't only reabsorb salt, we have to look at other ions molecules. So there's potassium in your filtrate that will get reabsorbed. This is not the potassium we just looked at, right? The potassium that we just looked at is potassium that's already in your blood. Here we're talking about potassium that's in the filtrate. Um, so it's pumped into uh, the tubule cell. Um, glucose is co-transported with the sodium from the lumen. That is what we just looked at. You will reabsorb 100% of your glucose unless your glucose uh, blood glucose levels have gone extremely high, right? And then you surpass your ability, but that is unusual, right? So unless someone is diabetic, 100%. So even when you eat a very sugary meal like a donut or a candy bar, um, you will still absorb all of that glucose. Only someone who is diabetic will have um, such high blood sugar that they won't be able to take all the glucose, okay? Um, Cl chloride follows sodium and uh, potassium passively, okay? So you only have to work with sodium potassium directly and chloride will just tag along or follow behind, okay? Water will follow the salt, remember? We've been talking about that. Um, it's osmosis, so when you have um, salt somewhere, water's going to want to flow towards it by osmosis. So, okay, we've been doing a lot of hard work. Let's take a, a break. Fun fact, average human drinks 16,000 gallons of water in a lifetime. That's such a big number that I decided to break that down further for you. Uh, one average sized bathtub holds about 80 gallons of water and so that would mean that you would be consuming about 200 bathtubs of water in your lifetime. I thought that was kind of fun. Okay, reabsorption in the loop of Henley. Okay, 
we have the counter current multiplier system. This is going to help concentrate the filtrate. As you move through the descending limb, only water is allowed to leave and it is going to leave through osmosis. The salt in the filtrate cannot leave the descending limb and that's why we say it concentrates. Then as the filtrate moves through the ascending limb, so it goes back up, then only salt can leave and it does. Okay, And this sounds weird, but this is actually a really um, perfect system that allows for a great amount of water and salt reabsorption to occur um, with the least amount of energy. Any other way that you were to set this up would take even more energy. Okay, so here we start out with uh, your filtrate has some salt in it, right, and water. And so the concentration of salt to water or water to salt gives you a milliosmolality of 300. And then you flow, your filtrate flows down the descending limb and water will leave. Remember the descending limb is permeable only to water. So water leaves. As water leaves, you get a more concentrated solution of salt, right? Filtrate of salt. So see this number increases 600, 800, 1000. And then finally, um, and you know I meant to update this because in the current edition, it only goes up to 1200. I don't know why this number has changed, um, but I will get, I will stick with the current edition. So we will not say 1400, we will say 1200. Okay, again, please make that change. The current edition, 1200 is the biggest number. So along the whole bottom region of this loop is 1200 milliosmolality. Uh, that's the most concentrated uh, salt, right, of solute. It's the most concentrated um, filtrate that you have. Okay, then your filtrate moves up the ascending limb and this notice that it gets thicker. The tissue has changed so that it is not permeable to water. So we say it's impermeable to water. Um, and the only thing that's allowed to leave is your, your sodium chloride. Um, these little circles with X's represent a pump system. Okay. Um, so you do actively pump in the ascending limb. It's actually two pumps. One is a co-transporter and the other is the sodium potassium pump. We're not going to uh, worry about the details, but this circle X here does represent um, a system of two pumps. It's explained in your book if you're curious how that works. But at the end of the day, I want you to know that only sodium can, can leave. Um, chloride will follow, tag behind, but water can only exit descending, sodium can exit ascending. And so notice that this number then gets smaller as sodium is pumped out of the ascending limb. You go back to a smaller and smaller osmolality until you get to 100. And then you're going to enter your uh, collecting duct, right? Well, distal proximal distal convoluted tubule and then your collecting duct okay so this is the counter current multiplier system that allows you to reabsorb lots of water and sodium okay so let's review the descending limb is impermeable sodium chloride potassium it is permeable to only water how does water exit? By osmosis. And it does this because of this high concentration of sodium right here. 
So it's, I know it seems backwards because this happens second, but because it's been happening as filtrate goes through and they are so close to each other, um, water will exit because of the high concentration of sodium. Okay, next, the ascending limb, only water can leave. Again, because of that high concentration of sodium that's in the interstitial space, um, the ascending limb is permeable. I'm sorry, I've gotten tired. Okay, ascending, going up, right, going up. It is impermeable to water and permeable to the ions. And it does this through active pumping. And as I mentioned, it's a two pump system. Um, what you need to know is that it's active, active pumping. Okay, so now we'll put it all together. We have our glomerulus, we have our filtrate going through the proximal tubule, entering the loop of Henle, going uh, down the descending loop, up the ascending limb, up the loop of Henle, into the distal tubule, which is really convoluted tubule, and then your collecting duct. And notice in your collecting duct, you can change the amount of water that you reabsorb, right? Also notice that you have, now we're showing your capillary. So you had a ferret blood coming into the glomerulus, and then you have your efferent arterial and, um, or capillary, and then that's going to stick around in close association with your nephron. And so um, as water leaves your filtrate and goes into the interstitial space, it'll be reabsorbed by this capillary and become part of your blood again, okay? Um, some um, more water here can leave the collecting duct, which is controlled by the hormone you know, antidiuretic hormone, ADH. So as if you release more um, antidiuretic hormone, then more water will be taken out of the filtrate, and then that will also be reabsorbed by capillaries. They're not shown, but they're, they're all over. Okay, so this is figure 17.18. And it's titled The Osmolarity of Different Regions of the Kidney. It talks about the counter current multiplier system in the nephron, and then the counter current exchange in the vasa recta, which is here. Okay, so please review that. We're going to um, talk about this collecting duct and ADH now. So, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, increases the permeability of the collecting duct to water so that you can take more water out of the filtrate and into the blood. It does this specifically by stimulating aquaporon channels in the collecting duct. So like I said, this is going to increase your water reabsorption and that's gonna vary depending on what you need. And so your urine concentration will vary as a result. If you take a lot of water back, then your concentration will be very high, 1400 milliosmolarity. But if you're not taking as much water, then it will be more dilute. Your urine would have more water in it and it would be dilute. If you increase water reabsorption, the urine will be concentrated because it will have less water in it. Okay. Result of water reabsorption, right? More water reabsorbed into the blood means more blood volume, and that means more blood pressure. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is released to, um, by the hypothalamus. So the release of ADH is controlled by the hypothalamus. Um, your osmoreceptors help your hypothalamus to know when ADH is needed. Uh, so os osmoreceptors are constantly monitoring the osmolality of the blood to make sure that it's maintained so that blood can function correctly. Um, 
and I believe that is it. Okay, guys, take a break, rewatch all the parts, study, 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 and get ready for part two. All right, and email me if you have questions. Good job.